When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the road called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudy morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let's talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Amen. What, what a great song. I, I mean, I was sitting here thinking that was one of the first hymns I learned after I got saved, and it was so early, I didn't know how to read a hymn book, so I just thought it was like right down the line, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it totally messed me up. But uh, I finally figured it out, amen, and so brings back brings back some good memories. Well, I hope that you're excited that your name will be called when the roll is called up yonder from the Lamb's Book of Life, and what a day that will be. And so it's great to see everybody. I hope that you're having a great week. Let's take some time to pray and ask the Lord to bless our services here tonight. Father. 
We thank you. God, you're so good to us. We thank you for your salvation that's through Jesus Christ. We thank you for his blood. We thank you that you've chosen this wonderful picture of writing our name in the book of life. And we're so thankful that we can have the assurance through you that, that we can be there. That when that role is called, that we can know and, and rejoice that we get to celebrate your majesty for all of eternity. So, Father, I pray as we do our part here on this earth tonight to worship you in spirit and in truth, I pray that you'll bless this time, bless our meeting together, work in our hearts, change us to be conformed into the image of your dear Son. And as you do so, may we be careful to glorify you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's turn to page 224. 224, 224, there shall be showers of blessings, and if your electronic device is on, you better turn it off. Somebody's going to beef us. Two, two, four. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. All right, thank you. you may be seated. We'll take some prayer requests tonight. And um, let me see. I don't believe I have too many uh, too many updates. I will tell you uh, briefly about Lisa. So we've been praying for the degree of her flexibility to increase, and I know ultimately um, she needs to get to 120. And um, yesterday, yesterday they uh, they put her at 110, and so that's that's an enormous change in just uh, just really a week or two, even. Uh, having been through the delay um, and the, the worry that she would be further delay from her hospital stay. So so we're pretty pumped about that. And so she's doing real well. But you continue to pray for her, if you will. And um, uh, pray for Kate and James. You know, they uh, they tied the knot, and it's, uh, it's pretty well tied at this point. And so I'm sure that they're enjoying themselves. And um, where I can't remember where they went to save my life. Um, Asheville, that's right, that's right. So I'm sure they're enjoying themselves. And uh, so you pray for them. And um, we'll take some other prayer requests tonight. Quincy has a test. I don't know when or about what, but yep, yep, Quincy's, Quincy's got a test. And so we'll, uh, we'll pray for Quincy. Um, yes, Quincy. Um, this month, I have a ton going on school wide. So I would like prayer. Well, yes, that's uh, that's good. So for Quincy to stay gainfully employed, not to procrastinate, to uh, let's see, you have a play coming up. Uh, I can't remember what you're doing next weekend, but for two weekends you're doing plays. And then that is next weekend, so my days are all mixed up. But you have plays coming up that you're doing and then graduating and then leaving for camp for the summer. So... He does indeed have quite a bit going on, so uh, you pray pray for him. Uh, Tara, how did your, you took your finals, yes? Or is that this week? That's this Saturday. Putting it off as long as you possibly can, I see. Yes, yes. Uh-huh, I see, I see. No, I don't blame you, I don't blame you. I'm just getting some, getting some situational awareness there, okay. Um, let's see, anybody, anybody else? I, I preempted a couple of you. Yes, Miss Tracy. Okay. So, thank you for the warning, everyone. If you can call in sick on Friday, uh, please do so. Reckless drivers will be on the road. Yes, yes, everyone, everyone around them. Okay, most definitely. And that starts Friday, you said, right? Okay, okay, perfect. Oh, oh, man, well, at least they're honest, you know. Okay. 
Okay. Lots, lots going on. I'm sure they're nervous, excited, thrilled, horrified, and all of the above. And so we will uh, we'll definitely be praying for them and for everyone in the vicinity. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm tracking all this. Um, did you say Ben and Alicia? Alyssa, okay. Okay, so Ben and Alyssa. Um, so she's she's got about a month left of her pregnancy, right? Okay, and so and they're concerned about uh, the amniotic fluid being um, too much, right? And that could result in a stillbirth, and so they're considering the possibility of a C-section in order to um, prevent prevent that uh, from taking place. And so pray for Ben and. I'm going to say it wrong. Alisa, Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa. I don't know how to spell that. That's why. Alyssa, Alyssa. I need a little accent mark there. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll pray for, we'll pray for them and um, pray that God has, gives them wisdom to make the uh, uh, prudent decision in that situation. Anybody else? Quincy. Yes. Quincy's finger is in need of healing. So uh, pray for pray for that. Anybody else? Yes, Mishila. Yes. Now, did, she, did, did I hear right that she had a procedure today or was she seeing the doctor today? Okay. Okay. And um, she's she's been in quite a bit of pain because of the the bandages that were wrapped too tightly and the the issues that came as a result of that, right? And so, do you know when her next appointment is? If you don't, it's okay. But okay, we'll just continue to pray for her legs and um, and really, it's the the fluid and then potential heart issues as well, right? Okay, all right, we'll continue to pray. Uh, pray for Miss Charlene there. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, pray for Kelsey and Alicia on their driving, uh, for Ben and Alyssa and uh, the concerns that they have with their pregnancy. Quincy's finger, uh, Miss Charlene, um, Tara, she gets ready for her finals, and Quincy for every test that he'll be taking from now until graduation. We got you covered, man. All right. Let's uh, find a prayer partner or pray to pray, pray on your own, and uh, we'll be back in about five minutes.
174, you have no 174. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. 174. Let's stand as we sing. My Jesus, I love thee. Thou art mine for thee, all the follies of sin, I resign my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I'll love thee in life. I'll love thee in death and praise thee as long as thou livest me breath and say when the death do lies cold on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus, tis now in mansions of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Thank you. you may be seated. Book of Haggai. Haggai tonight. We'll be finishing up chapter number one. We covered the first six verses last week, and so we'll pick up in verse 7, and we'll read down through the rest of the chapter here tonight in Haggai. We continue in our series, Big Lessons from Little Books. And I just, I'm excited, like, we're going to know the Bible. We may even find out where more Bible, books of the Bible are located as we go through this. And uh, so I'm excited. I'm very, very excited. And so um, Haggai, chapter 1 of this two-chapter book, and beginning in verse 7, the Bible says here, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. That's a lot of upons. Then Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, 
the high priest with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Tonight's message is simply a call to action. A call to action. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We give you thanks and praise that you still stir up your people when they obey. God, give us a heart to obey you, to obey your word. And I pray, Father, that as we do so, just as what happened here, you will be glorified and you will be pleased. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a story of a deaf member of a church uh, and... A conversation they had with a rather typical church attendee, and the uh, the typical church member uh, uh, seemed to ask and in, in, in wonder why this particular member who was deaf attended church, attended church services every week without fail. So why do you come? Why do you come if you can't hear anything? What is it that you're doing? And this humble man replied. I come each week to let people know what side I'm on. Now, I know some of you think that means this side or this side. We've seen the great divide. But he means the winning side, Jesus' side. He is on the Lord's side. And what this man embodied was the simple principle that we emphasized last time in last week's message. And that's found in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This was a man that, despite being deaf, he had his priorities in order. And, how, and last week, we discovered Haggai's message was a call to consideration, to identify those areas in our life that we've neglected, where we have failed to prioritize God's kingdom and God's church and this week, after having taken the time to make that thorough consideration of our lives, we see that like Haggai, you will be called to action, to take action on those considerations. Just like Haggai's audience, we all have to take action on our priorities if we're going to make obedience and faith a reality in our life. You see, our church is just like a bank. The more that you put into it, the more interest you have in it. So we want to keep pouring ourselves and pouring ourselves. But we found last week, as we looked at the first six verses of Haggai, that there are indeed, without a doubt, people who have plenty of money and plenty of time and plenty of talent that only expend their lives on their little kingdoms. They were down at their house, putting up luxurious items around their home and, and spending time on themselves and spending their energies on their material things rather than looking at the waste of the temple that laid in ruins and they failed to take action. They let it sit there for 18 years. And what a terrible, terrible testimony that it was. And yet God calls them back, as we'll see, to rebuild and to reprioritize this temple that will promote and exalt God's glory. And so I, I find it interesting that many of these people, as we read last week, would probably deny that they were spending time elsewhere, that Haggai's uh, retort was, was simply misguided. But Haggai, in all reality, said, no, you're, you're just setting yourselves up to be the kings of your own little kingdom. You're only emphasizing your own comforts. But we should go ahead and continue the work that God has called us to, 
make that our priority and get that settled. So Haggai issues his call to consideration, followed by this call to action in verses 7 through 11. Now we'll look at his admonition in verses 7 and 8 as we read once again, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified saith the Lord. Now the Lord again, just like he did in verse 5, exhorts the people to consider their ways, to reflect on their priorities, to be challenged to take action. Now, uh, having rebuked them for what they had not done, he's now going to show them the fruitlessness of what they had done. And the Lord is going to challenge them concerning what they should do. And what they should do is rebuild the temple, to put it extremely plainly. Now, the implications of verses 2 through 4 are now made explicitly clear in verse number 8. What does God want them to do? Build the house. There's no ambiguity there. There's no vagueness. He wants them to build the house, that is, God's temple. The need for bringing timber and wood down from the mountains implies that 18 years ago, when they had uh, all that timber and wood on loan from Lebanon and from other surrounding countries, it was gone. Could it be that they were using the wood intended for God's house to put up those nice paneled ceilings in their own house? Whoa. <laughs> Imagine the conviction that you would have if every time you went back to your house and you saw God's wood up on your ceiling going, you know, we really misuse that wood. It's supposed to be down at God's house. It was supposed to be for that purpose. So many times we have things that we could or should have used for God and yet we're content to see them perched proudly within our own homes. And I take great comfort, though, that despite all that, God says, just go back up to the mountain. I want you to obey. It's not too late to obey. Just go back up to the mountains, pull down the timber, and when you rebuild the house, it will please me. I will take pleasure in it, he says there in verse 8. It would indeed bring God honor and glory, the, the, the glory that's due his name, and even more importantly, as the, the building of the temple, as the place of worship in Israel. It would show all the nations that the God of Israel is worthy to be worshipped, that he's not going to be worshipped in a run-down, beaten-down, ruined temple, that his people are just content to walk by and see laid to waste. No, God's people think so highly of their holy God, the God that redeemed them, not just from Egypt, but released them once again from the Babylonian captivity. They think so highly of him and, and desire so deeply to glorify him that they will rebuild the temple even at their own cost, even at great sacrifice, even if they should have done it 18 years ago. They say, you know what, maybe we should have obeyed, but it's never too late to get right with God. And we're going to be a testimony we're going to be a testimony of God's mercy, his long-suffering, his forgiveness. And we're going to show, we're going to show that those things that we do will please God. And, and how wonderful it is that when we ourselves today do those things which please God, we also bring honor and glory that is due to his name. And we also become a testimony to those all around us who are looking to see if the God that we claim to worship really is worthy of our best efforts if he's really worthy of the sacrifice, if he's really worthy to be followed by faith and obeyed, if he's really everything that he says he is based on the way we live our, live our lives. David Brainerd, who was a missionary to the Indians throughout the New England area, uh, area during the 1700s, uh, once shared his desire to glorify God and to make that the most important thing in his life. And he shared that with another great preacher of that era, Jonathan Edwards. And as they were talking, David Brainerd said this. He says, I do not go to heaven to be advanced, but to give honor to God. In fact, it is no matter where I shall be stationed in heaven, whether I have a high or a low seat, but to live and please and glorify God. My heaven is to please God and glorify him and give all to him, and to be wholly devoted to his glory. 
See, David Brainerd wasn't content to wait till he got to heaven to make uh, heaven a place where God was glorified constantly. He sought, despite having on this mortal coil, which uh, refrained him at times in its sinful condition from fully yielding to God. Nevertheless, his desire was to give his utmost to the glory of God. And as he did, he felt that that was a glimpse of heaven right here on earth. And for David Brainerd, for the audience to whom uh, Haggai preached, it all came down to this. Will you prioritize God? Will you really promote His glory in your life? And will you promote His glory and grace among your family, among your friends, wherever you find yourself? Now, the question that needs to be answered is, what actually pleases God? We know we want to please God. We know that for Haggai's audience, for them, it was very clear, very specific, build the house. And we understand that because it had laid in waste. But what is it that is before us? We have no temple to build. We we, uh, are, are not exactly in the same situation and spot as Haggai's audience. But nevertheless, we would desire and should desire to glorify God and please him with our lives. And this is what it all comes down to. If you were to take it and just boil it down to all the brass tacks, what does it take to please God? A relationship that evidences faith and demonstrates obedience. There's a reason why the song Trust and Obey goes together, because you can't obey without faith, and you can't prove your faith without obey. They go hand in glove. Now, the secret for obedience is love, love for God, love for God above love for self. Jesus, of course, said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love is what constrains us. It's the love of Christ that helps fold ourselves into the mold of his image. It's what allows us to restrain ourselves from ungodliness and worldliness and be constrained. See, restraints are like seatbelts, things that we must be prevented from doing. Constraints are the things that we must do. We must give ourselves over to the love of God because when we do so, When we find ourselves longing for him, desperate for him, thirsting for him, searching for him as the hidden treasure, then, then we know what the love of God is. We see it. We see how he searched for us because he came to seek and to save. Do we seek God the way that he sought us, at least to the best of our human ability? See, we keep his commandments by loving him, by thirsting after him, by longing for him, by being desperate for him, by striving to see his glory evidenced all around our lives in any way, shape, or form that it could possibly take. And so for us, faith that demonstrates obedience looks like loving Jesus, loving Jesus more than loving self. And if we were to put both of Haggai's messages together, because really this is one sermon that he preached that we've split in two, we could look at them and say we must prioritize obedience and fuel our love for God. We, we have to come, not just to church, but to every day with a ready mind to say, today, I'm going to obey. I may not always understand, but I'm going to obey. Today, I'm going to have faith. I may not see the end from the beginning where I'm at, but I'm going to have faith that the one who sees all is already seeing all on my behalf. Now, how can we do this? Well, if we're going to love God and keep his commandments, then we have to know his commandments. The only way you know what his commandments are by reading his word. The only way that you uh, cleanse your way is by taking heed thereto according to God's word. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2. That's the only way we're blessed, by taking heed to God's word. We must know his commandments if we're going to follow them. And then we pray. Say, this sounds so simple, and yet we don't do it. Your your prayer is an act of dependence, saying, God, I know I can't do it. You think after 18 years, the Israelites would just spring up 
that they didn't have to be motivated. They walked by that site for 18 years. It's someone, it took someone coming along saying, hey, hey, it's time. It's time to build. You thought it wasn't time. It is time. It's time now. But how are we going to do it? God's going to help you. He's going to tell you how. He's going to show you where. He's going to make it happen. He's going to empower and solidify you. What does praying do? It shows that you can't do it on your own. It shows you can't do it in your own strength. It shows that you're willing to be dependent upon the Holy Ghost. Prayer in and of itself, even the very act, is an act of faith, an act of dependence. And then after you know what you should do and you've prayed to depend upon the Holy Spirit, then you take action. You have to put some feet to your prayers. You have to get up and actually do what it is God wants you to do. I'll tell you a story real quick. There was a time where I was seeking to understand the will of God for my life when it came to my employment. I had just moved to Tampa, and uh, after two months, the contract that I was working on suddenly was canceled. And I had to make some very serious decisions in a very short amount of time about what I was going to do for my employment. And I thought, well, I really want to stay in Tampa. I, I, I enjoy the church that I go to. I, um, you know, I'm you know, starting to, to really grow and, and, and things here. And I really felt that even when I moved here, that God was in this. And I don't, I don't think it's time, but I need to have a job. I mean, I need to put you know, some, some food uh, on my table. Now, back then, it was mostly peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and Hot Pockets. He said, you must have been single. How did you guess? That's right. That's all a man needs. If I'd have known about a crock Pot, you know, that would have changed my life, but that's something only married men learn about, the power of the crockpot, or else maybe, they, maybe they'd stay single, I don't know. But I digress. I had some decisions to make. Well, the Marine Corps called me up, and they said, oh, hey, it's Art Martin. I said, oh, no one calls me that anymore. And I said, yeah. They said, hey, this is Staff Sergeant Schmuckatelli from uh, the recruiter's office. You know, we can put you in a spot in about a month over in Colorado Springs, and we'll put you up in the barracks. And for some reason, I thought that was a great idea. Not a great idea. And, but I'm desperate. Yeah, I know you're laughing. Not a great idea, but I'm desperate. I need money. I need a job. And I told the staff sergeant, I said, well, um, that sounds great, but can I pray about it? And he said, um, sure. Oh, okay, all right, all right, good to go, good to go. Thanks, staff sergeant, all right. But, well, I prayed about it. And I'll tell you, I had no peace about going to Colorado Springs. And all Marine Corps jokes aside, I just, I just didn't have peace about it. You know what I had to do? I had to pick up the phone. I had to call that man back and say, I'm not doing it. And you know, when you hang up that phone, you still don't have any more options for employment. I'm still losing my job in a matter of days with no idea what's going to happen. Well, if you'd like to know the end of the story, I can tell you briefly that on the last day of that contract, I was approached by a gentleman who offered me a job. And three days later, I started working. God has a plan. He had a purpose. And if I hadn't stayed there, you would not be graced with my wife. Yes, amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. We weren't even dating at that point. So God had a plan. But it takes some faith. It takes some obedience. It takes making some tough calls. But that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to learn to please him through obedience, even through our faith. Now, Haggai gave them an admonition, and he went on to explain in verses 9 through 11 just what he was referencing in verses 5 through 7, because it becomes a little bit more specific, because the, the Israelites had really failed to do what they should. And as it, I'm beating the drum here, they failed to rebuild the temple. And that resulted in some significant economic ruin and poverty. There are really two steps, though, that brought them down to where they were at, and we read about them in verse 9. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste. And you run every man into his own house. What's going on here? Well, their harvest was much smaller than they expected. 
And for a while, even though their hopes were high, the yield was low. And eventually, when they did receive anything, it appeared to vanish all at once. As soon as they got it home, it's like God blew it away in the wind. It's like money burning that hole in your pocket. Like, did, didn't I just get paid the other day? I just got paid, didn't I? Th then my bank account should be a, a little bit higher, right? Right? No. I saw something recently that said, you know, if you gather all the receipts from your car or from your pocketbook, uh, you have a tiny book that reveals why you're dead broke. And that's true. And it seems as though these folks here, the Israelites, that when they brought home anything, God just went. Gone with the wind. And God explained the reasoning for that in the very end. And that says his chastening came as a, a direct result of their selfish neglect of the temple. They, it was laying waste. And they were busy with their own houses. It's not that they didn't have time. It's not that they didn't have money. They just simply did not have the inclination to prioritize God's house. And because of that disobedience, verse 10 and 11 tells us what happened. Well, the heavens withdrew everything. Uh, therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And verse 11 goes on to say it gets, it gets even worse. It's not just that it's not, there's no dew or water, but I called for a drought upon the land and you'll see upon everything. So the heavens withheld everything. They're dew from the earth and, and for an agriculturally based uh, society that went through dry seasons from April to October, the morning dew was extremely Extremely critical. Uh, the dew was normally very heavy in Palestine, and for it to dry up, their essential summer crops, gone. Totally gone. Their absence would have been a complete devastation. And then the drought comes on, and it affected the three main crops in Israel, and that's corn or grain, new wine, and oil. And that's the stuff that comes from oil trees. And, and anything, it says, whatsoever the ground produced. God says, look, I, don't got, I ain't got time to list all the stuff I'm taking from you. Just know, if it comes out of the ground, it ain't going to your house. He's cursed the land. And as a result, men and cattle couldn't eat. They're hungry. They, the food provisions are, are not there. And with what little strength they have left and that they could muster, the very labor of their hands is not as productive as it used to be. And, and all of this affliction is brought on them for one reason, to bring them back to God. See, God has a way of taking suffering and using it in his providence to teach us one single lesson. Come back. Come back. Discipline is God's way of saying, I want you to come back. It, it's not him saying, I'm through with you. It's not saying, oh, you've gone too far this time. Huh. <laughs> Don't even try to come back now. He says, no, I'm, I'm here. Come back. I want you to come back. It's like C.S. Lewis wrote one time where he said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our work. And he shouts at us in our pain. Because he's getting our attention. Because we're focusing somewhere else. And only as God or excuse me, as God's people put him first, will they experience the richest blessing. You know what the richest blessing is? It's not for the grain to come back. It's not for the new wine to flow. It's not for uh, the crops to spring forth from the ground. It's the blessing of knowing that you should please God. The blessing of knowing you bring glory to him. So what is the people's response? What do they do with this? Well, verses 12 through 15 explain this to us. The Bible says here, Then Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. You see, in light of this great truth that they knew they had an opportunity once again to please God by following him by faith and obedience, they decided to change their ways. They obeyed. Uh, Haggai's message was short and to the point. 
and their obedience was swift and immediate. They got right down to business. And Haggai reports to us that the leaders and the people had an amazingly quick and unmistakable response. Now, the response, their obedience was demonstrated really in two ways. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God as it came from the messenger and the message of Haggai the prophet. They recognized that Haggai's words were actually God's words. And this caused an immediate change in their attitudes. And they went on, as the verse says, to fear the Lord. The last part there says that, um, and, uh, and the people did fear before the Lord. And so they looked at God with a new sense of awe and reverence. They responded to this grace, how this time of ignorance God winked at, this 18 year period where they had ignored the house of God and, and through their misguided priorities uh, built their own selfish kingdoms. God, God overlooked that. And in that mercy, they had a new fear, a new awe, a new respect, a new reverence. See, God's gracious working provokes both fear and obedience. As a, as a result of their response, God could go on to give them the promise that we see there in verse 13. Then spake Haggai the, promi, uh, the, the prophet, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. What a blessing. These gracious words would be repeated again in chapter 2. And here they constitute an amazingly powerful message of encouragement. I'm with you. I'm with you. God's presence and his enablement guaranteed the successful outcome of that project. No matter what, no matter what the opposition was, no matter the variables that would come into play, no matter the difficulties, he, he says, I am with you. You see, to the mighty man of valor in the book of Judges, he said, fear not, I am with thee, thou mighty man of valor. To, for Hagar, the bewildered and forlorn mother that uh, was destitute in the wilderness, she said, Thou, God, seest me. And as she proclaimed that, it, it's an echo in our ears of Hebrews chapter 13, where God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This abiding love, this eternal reminder of the eternal God's the eternal presence in our life, how he's always there, he's always with us, will always stir us, just as he did the leaders in this people. Because verse 14 goes on to say that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua and the, the whole remnant. They were, they were stirred, they were moved, they weren't just challenged, they weren't just reproved, they were changed. It was different. Life would have a new outlook now. It, it, the 18 year dilemma of their past was forsaken. It was gone. It was done away with. They had confessed and forsaken it all. So that way they could be stirred that this God that brought them afresh out of Babylon was not done with them yet. And that they would obey and they would obey joyfully. And they got right down to business. Verse 14 says that they began to work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And I'm encouraged that there's a word of praise slipped in here a couple of times, and it's easy to miss because it's very subtle. And that word is remnant. You see, if you recall in the first message here, the first part of uh, Haggai's message, the Lord refer referred to them as this people. <laughs> like... Oh, that's your child when they mess up. But he says, now there's a remnant. You know what the connotation of remnant is? It's a group of people that actually behave like God's people, the way that they ought to behave as God's people. They epitomize faith and obedience to God. They are the remnant. They're not merely survivors of what happened in Babylon, but they've become what they always should have been, obedient within their covenant relationship to the Lord. Now, we don't always think in terms of covenant relationship, but the New Testament, the new covenant in Christ's blood is our covenant with Jesus Christ. 
And we demonstrate obedience and faith within that blessed, blood-bought covenant of Jesus Christ. And we demonstrate faith and obedience. And you'll see here in verse, 13, or excuse me, verse 15, gives us a little insight into what was taking place in the 23-day period between the time they heard the message and the time that things really started to happen. And now what had happened was, uh, I love that word, what had happened was, during that time when God blessed them, the Israelites had a harvest to pull in, just as God had promised. And they had to go up to the mountain to get the timber, just as they, just as they had promised. And it only took them 23 days. And they came back down, and they started to build. And I will tell you this, that they started to prepare Verse 15 is a verse of preparation. They prepared for the work. Think of it like this. An athlete who desires to be effective on game day must first be properly prepared. It takes hours of getting himself in shape, eating right, training the right way, uh, developing skills to a high degree to be ready in that moment. Because if he doesn't, he's not going to accomplish his objective on game day. And any Christian that wants to please God and to be effective in their Christian life must prepare. And they prepare to realize the tangible victories of faith by spending time with God. You prepare for your day by spending time with God. You conclude your day by spending time with God. In the heat of the battle, you spend time with God. You, you understand that when you show up to church and you want to be effective in your ministry, whatever that may be, having spent time with God, you bring health to the church. We, we can't neglect regular meetings. We can't neglect corporate worship. We can't neglect time spent with God, or else not only will we be ineffective, but we will be unhealthy. When we decide to obey the Lord, our faith becomes tangible. Now, I will tell you that thankfully, they went on to build. And history records for us that they did indeed finalize the task. They built the temple. It was completed in 516 B.C. You can look it up. Now, what does obedience, what does a life built around obedience really look like? Well, I'm going to appeal to Aunt Effie for this. Say who? Aunt Effie Lindquist. That's right. She attended the First Baptist Church of Cuckoo, pardon the name, in Iowa, uh, regularly for 88 years. 88 years, my goodness. I don't know how much she heard towards the end, but she certainly showed up. Now, during this time, she was at the church through 15 different pastors, okay? And she listened to over 8,000 sermons, attended more than 4,000 prayer meetings, and said over 29,000 bedtime prayers. You know, when I get to the end of my journey... I don't know what the count will be, but I hope it's a testament to faithfulness. I hope that when I, that when you build a life around faithfulness, you'll see tangible evidence of what's gone on. That, that you say, hey, you know what? I love God and I kept his commandments and I abided in his love. And, and that became one of my daily goals. Every day I sought to love God and to obey him. And then I, I started to see how faith became strong and mature. I started to see how my family was unified as we built the temple within our own home and we gathered together at the temple, God's place of worship for us to be unified and brought together. I, I got to see that as my faith Faith changed and the, the, cha the faith of others in the church changed. We, we saw that we could gain and maintain health within our church. We reached depth with God. Our hope began to flourish. Our charity abounded, not just to one another, but to the community. Souls were saved. Relationships were mended and matured, and, and God's work got done. He says, build the house. And keep building, but start by preparing. God's called you to consider your ways. And I hope that last week you thought about your life, your lifestyle, your legacy, and about what that means. But now, commensurate with Haggai, it's time to take action. 
If you're not preparing with God for your day, you're not prepared. If you're not preparing for church with prayer and Bible reading and relying on the Holy Ghost, you're not prepared. You can be in attendance, but you're not prepared. If, if God is afflicting you, he's trying to get your attention. If things are rocky, if things aren't as smooth as you want them to be, if things are going completely haywire, if, if the Holy Spirit is whispering to you and you're blowing him off and he's saying, you know, you shouldn't do this, not a path you want to go down, this is not what you should be doing, you need to get your priorities right, start listening. Start listening. Because if you're not prepared now, in the moments when he whispers, what will you do? When he starts shouting in your pain, what will you do then? Is that what it will take to be prepared? What's it going to take? God forbid it takes 18 years of turmoil and a ruined, decimated temple of a home, a temple of a family that's ruined, a church that's dilapidated and falls apart because we fail to prepare our hearts, our homes, and the house of God. God forbid so whatever it is the Lord laid on your heart to consider last week or in this message, consider it, but rise to take action. Take those necessary steps to become obedient and to become faithful. And God will see you through the building of the temple of your life. Father, we thank you that your grace is sufficient for us that you and your mercy have overlooked the times of our disobedience. And God, as a result, you've called us back once again to take action, to return to your side. And I pray, Father, that as we give ourselves over to your work, to be prepared as a people that are called by your name, Lord, I pray that as we make these changes, that you will take pleasure, as you have said, and that you will be glorified. For that is all that we do and long to do ultimately in our life. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ladies, tomorrow night is your night for the do-it-yourself uh, night with the uh, Essentially Topsail and Wax Eloquent. So I know that many people have signed up and... Um, Make sure that you are here. It's actually here at the church, 530. And uh, I know that y'all are going to have a lot of fun. And, uh, and so that'll be a, a real good thing. We have a lot of sign-up sheets that are out there. I say a lot. There's really three. One's for tomorrow night, and most of you have already signed up. But please, if you're going to attend the marriage enrichment morning on Saturday, May 15th, please sign up. I need to sign up. Um, now, look, I'm going to make brisket, okay? And if y'all don't show up, that's more for me. Y'all have been warned, okay? I don't mind brisket. In fact, I, I love brisket. Um, but if you want to partake of a fabulous marriage enrichment morning, uh, then, then come on down, all right? And get some brisket while you're there too. But please, so that way I can continue my planning appropriately, uh, make sure you sign up. Now you have a little bit of time. That's not a, that's not a you know, a subtlety to procrastinate, but you do have a little bit of time. And there's some other stuff out there for you. And that's all the announcements that I'm going to make. Uh, and so I believe... My wife's not in here. She's at Patch Club. And so uh, we're just going to roll with it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, you're so good to us. I pray that as we go our way that we would do so rejoicing over your grace, thanking you for your mercy, and, Lord, for your long-suffering and your patience with us. God, be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.